before we start this video, a large thank you to Nerve Corporation, Justine, Frosty Feet, Amir, Prakash, and Yuri for their support on Patreon. I hope you guys enjoy the video. And an immense thank you, as always, to Halo Burner for their continued support to the channel this month on Patreon. You are a legend, my friend, and I hope you enjoy the video. Hello, everybody. There's a hailstorm outside my house right now, so if you hear that noise, I apologize. So, what we have in front of us right now is a map of the demo in Nephilim. Let me just bring this up here. Because what we're going to do next is we're going to work on world streaming, as was requested by people in the Discord. Uh, and this is a pretty lengthy topic. It's not difficult, but there are a lot of moving parts. So I want to use the majority of this video, uh, maybe the whole video, to talk about what we're going to do. So you're going to see here in my scene view, I actually have multiple scenes. I have the world, and then I have, along with that, area, area zero, and then a one, so area zero here is, we'll think of this like the main area. So there's only one place, that's the Shrine of Safe Return where you spawn in. And there's area one, which is Whispering Woods, which is what we're looking at. But you'll see area one has multiple sub areas. We have Tunnel East, Tunnel West, and then we have Cathedral, and then we have Interior. I've done this because what you want to do with world streaming is you want to only load in what you need. And I'm going to explain that further. Let's say, for example, you're on the precipice, which is right here, this spot down south, and maybe editing Seb will draw a circle around it, as you should do that editing Seb, so you can see it. When you're standing on the precipice, you're actually up higher uh, than the lower part of the woods in the south, so you can see a few areas. Now, if I'm standing on the precipice, obviously I need to load the precipice itself, but what a good practice is when you're doing world streaming is you want to load all the accessible areas around the area you're in. That's step one. So what does that mean? Well, to get to the precipice, you have to access an elevator from the mines. So we would want to keep the mines loaded in case the player turned around and looked back down the elevator or, or wanted to go back to the mines for that matter. From the precipice, you can also access the southern part of the woods so we would want to keep that loaded as well. So from the precipice now we have the main scene and we have all the attaching scenes, which again is the southern woods and then the mines. That's step one, loading every scene that you can access from the scene that you're in, including the scene that you're in. Think about it like if you were in a square, if you think about like a tile system, right? There's a grid and you know what? I'll show this on screen again now too. Future Seb, do an edit of the grid on screen. And now the square that you're in, on this tile board, you want to load every square around it so that no matter what direction you go, the next scene will be loaded. I hope that's very clear. That is step one. Step two is you also want to load every scene you can see from where you're standing or a stand-in of that scene in some capacity. What do I mean by this? Well, we'll go back to Whispering Woods again. If I am on the precipice, which is a very high point, in the most southern part of Whispering Woods. From this point, I can actually see the cathedral. And there's gameplay footage of this. If you play the demo, then you'll know when you walk into the mines and you hit the precipice, you can see the cathedral in the distance. I have two choices here. I can either load in the cathedral itself, which is what I currently do, but a better choice would be to make a simplistic version of the cathedral using, uh, they're called imposters. So it basically is just a flat image but you're so far away, you can't tell anyway. Elden Ring and Dark Souls do this all the time. And you load that in instead. So that would be a fake version of the scene. Uh, and then if you get close enough, you load in the actual cathedral and said, this just simply saves memory. It isn't required, uh, but if you want to be as good as you can about saving memory, it's what you should do. And I'm very likely going to do it um, for the final version of the game for bigger areas like the cathedral. So let's reiterate. Step one is to load the scene that you're going to be in, obviously. And step two is to load all the scenes around it that can access this scene through a path or a way of getting in. So from the precipice, we get there from the mines or the southern woods. So we load in both of those. And finally, we load in either the real scenes or stand-in scenes of any other place we can see. Okay? So that is world streaming in a nutshell, a very simplified version of it. Uh, I want to make a note now at this point in the video too. This is somewhat new to me. I've been doing it for a few months now, and when I first began, uh, at least unless I missed it, 
there wasn't a whole lot of documentation on proper practices with streaming uh, multiple additive scenes with a multiplayer game. There was some ways on how you should go about utilizing the network scene manager. I won't get into this too much for now, but what I want to say is if you have a better way of doing this and you are experienced and you see me doing something that you think is inefficient or can be done better, uh, please comment below and let me know. And uh, let me know what you did and why. I would love to get other people's insight on this. I'm going to offer you up how I did it. And uh, if you can think of a way to improve upon that, I would love to hear that. So now with the general guidelines of what we're going to do out of the way, what do we need to do? Uh, and by that, I mean, what is the actual functional setup of how we should go about this? And I'm actually going to load into my world scene manager here in Nephilim. And I'm going to walk you through uh, the pseudo code rather of what we're going to do. And if you want to give this an attempt on your own before I actually go get into this, I would really highly, highly, highly recommend it because this is a this is a fantastic opportunity to dive into something completely unknown. If it's not known to you, take a look at some of the documentation I've listed and give it a try on your own. And you you'll learn a lot from this. This is a this is definitely a more advanced topic and a great way to build some confidence or at the very least some experience. So the actual process would be to step one, you only want to load your scenes now and unload your scenes with the network scene manager. This matters and it is very important because the network scene manager is basically going to remember for you what scenes are loaded on the host so that when a client connects to the host, there will be the same scenes loaded for them. So after that setup and we load our scenes, we're changing over from the regular scene manager to the network scene manager, which again is very simplistic. Uh, it's a pretty easy process. You just make a different call most of the time. Uh, there are some things that are a little bit different, but for the most part, that's it. After that, we'll have a checklist of things we want to do. We want to set up a world scene manager. And if you want to, you can include the sub scene manager in the same uh, file. So we need a world scene manager and a world sub scene manager. I make them separate for just reasons because I'm weird about my naming conventions and where I want to place things. But what we need to do with those is basically we need to keep track of all the world scene IDs. Um, unless you have some weird plugin that lets you save scenes as variables in Unity. I think that's a, that's a thing. You can get it on Git. But doing it the bare bones way, we need a, a variable for each scene using its ID with the name of a string. So if you have, for example, um, you have area 1, 2, and 3, you're going to have scenes, variables, area 1, 2, and 3. Next, we need to make an enum for each of these because we're going to have things like breakables and AI that are going to be in each scene. And we're going to use this to basically know when to spawn and despawn them. Uh, so we're going to have a world scene ID and also an enum that attributes to each scene. We're going to have getter methods for both the getting the enum and getting the string. And again, this is just how I do it. If you think of a more efficient way, very cool. Let me know down below after you watch the few episodes that will come out following this. And then what we're going to do is basically create a function that will load the scene when you spawn into the game and all scenes around that area. Uh, this function will also be used when you basically pass through into another scene. You're going to call this. That's what we were talking about first, like loading the cube around the, other, around the uh, initial cube. And then we need a scene too to find all the players in each individual scene. Why do we need this? Well, let's say you're playing co-op. And if you're going to use fog barriers like Elden Ring, you don't need this at all because the fog barriers keep you all in the same scene. That's fine. But if you don't want the fog barriers like Elden Ring, it would be wise to keep track of where your players are because if a client wanders away from the host, then the host needs to load scenes up for him and also make sure those AI load into that area because the host controls all that stuff. And again, if this sounds dense, you don't worry. It's only dense because I'm saying this all at once. When we take this and break it down step by step, it's going to be pretty straightforward. So we need to keep track of players in uh, each scene. And we need to keep lists for that. Uh, and we need to make functions to add them or remove them to the lists. And then we need to make a do not unload list based on the player locations. Because every time a player is going to pass into a new scene, obviously we need to unload all the unused scenes. Otherwise, eventually you'd have your whole map loaded up. And that would defeat the purpose of streaming your world because you're no longer saving memory. So we keep track of this list. And then every time a player passes into a new scene, we check every scene to see if it contains players. And then we load the scenes around those players that need to be loaded. And that is essentially the whole process. Now, 
you don't necessarily need to keep track of players in each scene if you want to do it the Elden Ring way of basically making sure players can't leave an area without each other. And honestly, uh, that's a much more streamlined and easier way to do it. You're sacrificing some minor amount of freedom, but if you put a check between each area that players have to like basically ready up for, um, that's going to be a whole lot easier to micromanage in terms of your world streaming and will save you memory for the most part. So that's a decision you'll have to make. If you think your game is so complex that taking the time to optimize it down to a stable level if both players walk to opposite ends of the map is a chore, then maybe lock them into it like Elden Ring and Dark Souls does where they're just in an area until they leave together. Okay, another note is that you're always going to have one main scene that is always loaded and never becomes unloaded, so I just called that world. Uh, and I'm told it's good practice to keep your characters in here. Um, so what I do is I put my character spawners in here. And then I basically access those spawners via location by giving them a tag. That's where the enum comes in. So for example, Southern Whispering Woods has a whole selection of monsters. And when I walk into Southern Whispering Woods, then basically it's going to reference my world AI manager, which is going to grab every character from the Southern Whispering Woods and then activate their spawners in the main world scene. The main world scene also acts as the default scene, so let's say something gets instantiated into your world, it will basically go into that scene. And again, if any world streaming wizards have something to add to this, please leave in the comments. Okay, one final tip that I will be doing a disservice if I had not told you about. This comes from Athos. He is an amazing programmer, also has a YouTube channel. I actually learned a lot of my stuff initially from him. Great guy. But there's a thing you can do called decoupling an area or zone. And basically, if you're the host and you have to load multiple scenes because you have other people walking around in them, obviously, if you're not there, you're now wasting a lot of memory because you're loading those renderers, okay, to, for that person to be there. Because you want to load scene 6, 7, and 8 if your character's in scene 6 and they can see 7 and 8. But what if you're back in scene 3? Do you understand what I'm saying? There's a lot of wasted memory there because you don't actually see what's going on. So a solution to this is to actually decouple your renderers and your colliders. And what you want to do is, if you're not personally in that scene, you can just disable all the renderers and then keep the colliders present. So your AI can still walk around and do everything and then you can pass their actual position off to the clients, etc., etc. And all this happens without you needing to have the renderers enabled, which will save you memory. This again, might not be required. I don't do it in Nephilim yet. And in the current unstable version, I'm getting pretty stable frames all around, even on lower end hardware. But if you are making a mega scale project, I would absolutely implement this. All right, and last warning, I'm gonna bring this one up again uh, when I'm in the series. So a few months ago, I had the most updated version of netcode. I can't remember at the time what it was, maybe it was 2.2 or 2.1. There was a bug in that version of netcode that made it so you could not use additive scenes properly. I've since passed this off to an engineer and I have reported it and uh, it could be fixed by now because it has been months. But if we get to that point in the series and the bug is still there, I'll show you what I did. We're going to change your netcode version and it works just fine. Okay, I know that was a lot of explaining, but I really do feel like it was very helpful uh, to many people to get the groundwork out there and to get a map of what we're doing and where we're going to approach this from. Because to a lot of people, I get it. You can just kind of like, we can just kind of do it as it comes up and you can see the, the bigger picture for what it is. But at the same time, I feel like many benefit from getting this out there like this. I was going to set up the scene manager in this video, but we are actually pretty deep into it already. So I will leave that for the next video. So the plan for the next video is to set up the scene manager and get into a situation where we're loading scenes through that. And then also set up a system where we can load scenes around the initial scene. I don't expect this to be too long. I could stand to be mistaken. Uh, however, I think we could get this whole system done in an episode or two. But then when you're adding things to your world, we're going to have to come back to this and change it slightly. For example, breakable objects. You don't want to load them all in at once. Same thing with characters. We can now assign them a zone and you can load in certain characters based on the zone that you're in and then deload them, etc., etc. Okay, everybody. Thank you very much for tuning in. Thank you for taking the time to like and comment in the video to those of you that do. Thank you very much, my patrons. It is because of you that the series may continue at the rate that it does. You have my gratitude. Okay, guys, I'll see you next week. When we get back to this, we're going to start hammering out all the functionality, and we're going to make it so our world can stream additive scene by additive scene.